All right. Well, you guys are watching the end of part one of problems of population growth. And I'm starting at this particular slide because I think that every class had gotten at least this far. So if you are a little bit further than this, you are welcome to fast forward the, the PowerPoint to the, the point that your class got to. But if not, it's, it's totally OK to watch this part uh, and just kind of remind yourself. So at the end of class, for most of you, uh, we talked about a guy named Thomas Malthus. And Malthusian theory was very apocalyptic. He believed that, uh, because remember, contextually, he's, he's living during the uh, Industrial Revolution of the first country that had ever gone through the Industrial Revolution, and that was England. And he saw that uh, their population was exploding, and he thought that the population was going to grow because, remember, and if you didn't get this down, the, the population grows exponentially. And so when you add population to an existing population, it grows rather fast, it kind of grows like money in a bank. Uh, when you have money in a bank and it grows exponentially, that's really good for your interest. But if you have human beings, uh, that tends to make the population go up pretty quickly. Whereas food supply grows only arithmetically. And so it's going to be instead of a curve J curve, it's going to look more like a straight uh, diagonal line. And so Malthus, he believed that you're going to have uh, starving, mass starvations, you're going to have wars over food and just really bad things. And so that's represented by the J curve there. What he, what Malthus didn't know was that countries would go through demographic transition. And now you know that. So you know that as we look at that J part, that's, that's stages one and two. And eventually you're, as you urbanize, as, as women get more education, as women, uh, you know, get jobs and access to birth control. And for, for various reasons, the, that birth rate is going to come down until it levels out and you in transition at the end of that S curve. Uh, and then if we continue that S curve, it would actually start dipping down a little bit. So that's the difference between the J curve and the S curve. Now, when you do your examples, I want you to think of countries today that represent the J curve. So you should be thinking, you know, something like Mali or Niger or uh, you know, pretty much anything in Ivory Coast, um, Sierra Leone, uh, Namibia, like anything in Sub-Saharan Africa would be fine for that J curve. For your S curve, you want like the United States, you want the United Kingdom, you want something where they have basically gone down to ZPG. Okay, population pyramids, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we spent uh, a good chunk of a class doing this, but just as a brief brush up, Remember that the population pyramid is a graphic, kind of a visual representation of demographic information. It's much easier to digest and to look at than just a bunch of numbers on a screen. Okay, and so we, I'm going to give you guys a bunch of uh, population pyramids and just make sure that you have down one or two of these as your examples. Remember that boys are on the left, girls are on the right, old people at the top and uh, young people at the bottom. It's divided up into five year age intervals, which we call cohorts. So like zero to five or, um, you know, uh, six to nine or six to 10 or wh whatever the case may be, you, you've got those five-year intervals. Okay, we, we use population pyramids to see what the dependency ratio is, what the, the in this case, the gender and sex ratio is, um, you know, what kind of problems that a country might have based on how many old versus young people they have or uh, compared to their worker bees. Or if you're talking about like the gender or sex ratio, then you're talking about uh, the number of males compared to, and I should, <laughs> as I was just say, number of males to females. So add the FE in there. I just saw that in there. Make sure it should be number of males to females. So usually this is given as, um, you know, some sort of number, and we can assume that that's a number of males to females. So either like 1.02 to 1 or 105 to 100. Okay, dependency ratio then, if gender or sex ratio, is taking a look at the number of males to females. Remember in class, we talked about this, like in LDCs, you're almost always going to see a, a skewed number of males to females because of the, the, the cultural preference for boys. Uh, boys, you know, typically will stay home their whole lives. They'll take care of parents in old age. They do labor, they carry on the family name. Uh, whereas the daughters are gonna marry off and go somewhere else. The males will bring daughters into the family uh, so, you know, there's this cultural preference for boys. In LDCs, we typically see a higher number of males to females, whereas NDCs, um, if we look at the top of pyramids, usually in an MDC, the females are outliving the males, and we see a slight increase of females to males in MDCs. Remember also in LDCs that the number one killer of females is going to be childbirth. Uh, 
Okay, in dependency ratio, we're, we're measuring now uh, the social or economic impact of having a lot of very, very young people like beneath the age of 15 or the, the number of old people like we've talked about in the case of Japan uh, that create dependency issues. And so you have, you know, you don't have enough worker bees to take care of all the people that can't take care of themselves. And in, in either situation, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be issues. Okay, so stage two and stage three country, they're gonna have high dependency ratio of young people. So maybe think about some country you can use for example in your chart. So maybe uh, something like El Salvador. El Salvador is a stage three country. They're gonna have a high dependency ratio of young people. Whereas um, Italy, they would be a good example of stage five country. They're gonna have a high dependency ratio of old people. The most stable stage in all of that is going to be stage four. Of course, we would think, well, stage one might be kind of stable too. It's actually less stable than stage four. Remember in stage one, you've got high births, but you also got high deaths, uh, low literacy rate, or I'm sorry, low life expectancy rate. So I would probably say, you know, as a country, if you're a government, really what you're shooting for is stage four. You have slow, continued growth. Uh, your population is very stable. Uh, you probably have a decent amount of medicine. So these are all good things to have for your country. You really want to have stage four. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Stabilizing our population. The, the best way that we can stabilize our population is to urbanize. At first, that might be a rough process. If we look at the stage two countries, we can find slums there. We're going to find slums in stage two and stage three countries. So if we go to Nairobi, Kenya, uh, if we go to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, or even a stage three country like Mumbai, India, we're gonna find some pretty big slums on the outside, but this is kind of like a, a growing pain. Uh, this is kind of a, a short-term problem for a long-term solution. And so eventually as the, you know, as education gets more widely dispersed, as wealth gets more widely dispersed, the demographic transition shows us through the industrial revolution that um, you will have less and less poor people if you kind of, you know, if, if your government does things correctly and your your fertility rates will drop same thing with you it's very important that you educate your population including your girls and if you want to bring down your fertility rates probably giving girls a, a choice over their lives and their future and, and allow them to get jobs and have rights and things like that that's going to bring your fertility rates down so your tfr is going to drop down to two pretty quickly if you start uh, putting your girls in school uh, you know it, up until the time that they're in high school or maybe even in college and then, of course, as technology gets better, you can give your girls access to birth controls. And, and this really gives them power over their body to, to decide when and if they want to have children. OK, so quickly, as we go through those stages, remember that if you look at the bottom there, uh, those cohorts that keep going out and out and out, that is rapid growth. Then we have an example of Israel where you have moderate growth still growing. You still have a lot of people each cohort. Um, but if it was a stage four country, that bottom part would be like twice as high. So like if we get to the United States here, if we go back here, you can see the difference between the two. There's a stage three compared to a stage four. OK, and then here's Italy with a stage five. They've got a good chunk of their people uh, that are above the age of 40. That's that's kind of getting scary for them because they're they're starting to have less and less people in those lower cohorts. That's going to be tough on their economy. That's going to be tough because they're going to have to take care of a lot of elderly people. Um, elderly people require a lot of health care. That's very expensive. And a lot of the taxpayers are going to have to pay for that. OK, to end this lecture up, we're going to be talking about what governments do if you um, if you have too many people or if you in some cases, if you don't have enough. So if you have too many people or you have explosive population growth, we have seen some countries, governments enact what are called um, antinatalist policies. And so these are restrictions created by a country's government to reduce population growth. And of course, the most famous one of these would be the, you know, would be the, uh, the, the China one child policy. So let me just put this up on the screen. You guys can kind of write these down. Let me, I'll give you just a minute. And so while I kind of talk about these things, make sure you're writing some of these things down and anything else that I uh, talk about that you, you may want to add in there might be a good idea. All right. So what can a government do to slow down their population? Well, um, there's a lot of things they can do. So let's just talk, start talking about China's one child policy. Like, what did they really do? Well, what they really did was they taxed. So if you in, you know, if you had a, a girl that for your first child, you could ask the government for permission to try for a second one. 
And if you did and you had a boy, great, then, then you were good. You didn't have to pay any taxes. But if you were unfortunate enough and you had a second girl, then you would have to pay taxes on the second child. And the problem is for rural people, that was like a, almost a decade's worth of income for them. And so some really shady and sketchy things started happening where they were giving kids up to orphanages. Heck, they were even leaving them like in parks, uh, abandoning them uh, in, you know, in, in the city center uh, or someplace where they knew people would pick them up or taking them and just dropping them off at an orphanage. Uh, or even worse, they might even like just put them in a dumpster and allow them to die. Um, and, and some really, really messed up things happen. Um, so we'll kind of, I'm going to show you guys a video that, that shows some of the social impacts of the one child policy. So more about that later. Okay. Some other things that your government can do, they can do what are called sterilizations. In other words, they can make sure that your parents, uh, or that the, the parents in that country, their reproductive parts are not reproductive anymore. So they can tie the tubes, they can make snips where they need to and all sorts of other unpleasant things that you would think about in terms of uh, making sure that, uh, well, things just didn't happen the way they were supposed to happen. OK, another one, propaganda. Uh, I want you to look down at the, uh, the the China one child policy. Look, Oh, look how nice that family looks. They look so happy with one child. Or you can see uh, the one up at the top there, one, two, and that's ideal. So that's just propaganda from countries saying, hey, look, here's the ideal for the perfect family. Let's not have a bunch of people. Let's just have a couple of kids. All right. So propaganda is just kind of any information that's going to influence the way you think or the things that you do. Um, another anti-natalist policy is give your education to your women. If they are able to, to get an education, then they will have power over their bodies. They can make decisions for themselves. And one of the things that's logically going to happen is they're going to put off the years uh, that they'll have for childbirth and end up only having one or two kids. Okay. And same thing goes with empowering women through legislation. Give them rights, give them votes, uh, give them power over their bodies, uh, allow them to take birth control, and that's going to cut down your fertility rates. Okay, so India, uh, they did paid sterilizations. They did what's called birth spacing. You should probably write this down about birth spacing. Birth spacing means that you, you would have a child, but then you would wait two to three years before you tried again for your next child. And again, this cuts down the number of fertile years of a female because a female's reproductive years are really probably from about 14 through 35, maybe 40. So if you can space those births out, you're likely to have less kids. And that's what birth spacing is. Um, I don't have South Korea on here. They're an interesting one. But at one point, South Korea was... Um, paying for sterilizations and then their birth rates got too low. And so they, they were paying for the surgery to undo those sterilizations. Um, so you can, I, I guess you, as a country, you can have both of those. Nigeria, they did, they, right now they are doing, um, you know, tax supported government paid family planning assistance. They're distributing birth control to people. They're teaching about birth spacing. They're teaching about the importance of keeping girls and why girls are important. Um, you know, they're stressing to, you know, people at large that that boys and girls have an equal importance and that once they get to like two kids, then, then that's, you know, that's enough. So uh, those are some things that countries do in terms of keeping their birth rates down. All right. Now, on the other hand, we have other countries that that are what we call natalist or pro natalist. And uh, you can see that. Um, it's going to be some of the same things, which is kind of the opposite way. So, I mean, you can use propaganda. So if you look at the, the, the mother Russia, uh, you can see that uh, there you have, if you, <laughs> Russia actually did for a while, they did prizes. And so in rural areas of Russia, they were giving away microwaves and refrigerators and uh, all sorts of little gifts and things that would help out at a household. There was even this thing called the mother Russia award where if you had, I think it was six kids, then they would give you some government paid for um, van, minivan or SUV. And uh, you can see there in the middle of the, that mother is uh, hailed as a patriot. All the kids are looking at her with, uh, you know, with, with the pride and, and looking up to her. So there's various things you can do. All right. So you could, you could just flat out outlaw abortion. You could outlaw birth control. Uh, you could outlaw condoms. Um, anything that would stop pregnancies now, remember if you're like Russia or Italy or um, 
Japan, you may want to think about doing these things so that you can get your people to, to, to actually get pregnant. And you have the opposite problem of an India or a China or something in sub-Saharan Africa. Now you may want your, your people to get, uh, you know, to get pregnant and have, have babies. Okay. Another thing that you could really do is, um, you know, just make it financially beneficial to have kids. And so you could give them huge tax breaks for having kids. You could give them maternity and paternity leave. Um, Northern Europe, Scandinavian countries like Norway and Sweden, they will give their parents sometimes half a year off or even in some cases a year off to have children. And their, you know, the government will subsidize their paychecks or their employers will be required to pay them, um, you know, the vast majority of their regular salary because they think it's so important to, you know, to, to have children. So some kind of benefit from your employer, uh, subsid subsidizing their, their paycheck through the government, uh, anything like that. And then the other thing that we're seeing some governments do, and we've seen this in, in Canada, where in the Quebec area, their, their fertility rates dropped so low that they were even approaching, you know, a TFR of one. And so they, they realized they needed to have more people and they're, you know, the, even with financial incentives, the, the people didn't want to have kids. <laughs> and so um, they, they said, well, um, let's, you know, let's open our country up to immigration and that'll bring a, that'll just bring more people in. And then, you know, immigrants typically are from stage two and stage three countries where their birth rates are higher than our people. And so, you know, that'll increase the birth rate that way as well. And that was kind of interesting in Quebec because then all of a sudden they had kind of a, a cultural problem where you had all these people that are coming into their country that didn't speak French. And so they were they were doing all sorts of things to try to you know pay pay these immigrants to learn French and to indoctrinate them and to culturate them into um, you know Quebecois uh, culture and society, which created kind of like we talked about with China briefly, just created some interesting social dynamics by doing that. But that is another way to to get the birth rates going is by just allowing immigrants to come in. Okay, so there's some examples for you again. Western and Northern Europe paid and extended maternity and paternity. Paternity leave means the fathers get to stay at home. Maternity means the moms get to stay at home. Um, Russia, we talked about the, the prizes for patriotic mothers using the propaganda you see there on the right. And then, you know, Italy, uh, they gave tax breaks. The Catholic, Catholic Church encourages their believers not to use birth control. I don't know how much of this is helping. Their median age in Italy is higher. Uh, but at least they're encouraged not to use that birth control. Okay, that should be it for the problems of population growth. You now are going to transition to the video lecture for problems of population growth part two.